Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to something a little bit different. Welcome to a feature that um, I'm hoping to produce for, in conjunction with the Fluff and Hammer, which, for those of you who don't know, is a podcast and indeed a a small community that um, I and my compatriot Adam Nichols set up, which is based around the worlds and universes of Games Workshop, the Warhammer or Age of Sigma and Warhammer 40,000 universes. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is or where to find it, if you check out the links below, um, you'll find the podcast and the Facebook page and the, the web page for the Fluff and Hammer. It's a very cool community. It's a very cool community. It's very positive, very forward thinking. There's a lot of great creativity that comes out of it. It's a fun, fun hobby and a, a well worthwhile um, experiment, I feel. I'm very pleased to have, uh, to be part of it. For this series, I'm hoping to have a look at the, I suppose, the history of my particular army. The army I always go back to in the, in both the game and the background. The one that really piques my interest, which is, of course, the forces of chaos. Now, I'm going to be doing this on a book-by-book -book basis, um, starting right at the very, very beginning with the book that I hold in my hand, which is Realm of Chaos Slaves to Darkness. Now, this this is an amazing bit of work. It's a, I love it for what it represents as an historical artifact, because it, it was produced in the 1980s, and it was one of the very first books of its kind, insofar as I'm aware. Um, this was actually really before my time. I came into the hobby around the... Ju just in the earliest days of Second Ed, 40k. So just bef just after the original Warhammer 40,000, which was called Rogue Trader, had um, had been discontinued, um, and the shift from Rogue Trader to Second Ed was profound, really profound. One of the the things about Rogue Trader is that it was very, I suppose you could call it naive. It was the first game system of its type. It was very much beholden to the role, tabletop role-playing systems that the creators and designers had been inspired, originally inspired by, and so was ridiculously detailed and complex. Every single miniature was its own character, essentially. It would be the equivalent of a character now. Even the individual troopers back then had more detail and more in the way of individual stats and equipment than the characters in the games do now. So they were so difficult, the games were so complex and so difficult to play back in Rogue Trader that you needed the equivalent of a DM, of a dungeon master. You needed someone to officiate over the games because to keep track of it all was absolutely lunatic. And the Realm of Chaos books were a grand experiment in the sense that they were some of the very first army books that elaborated the universes and that provided uh, the forces of chaos anyway. And some of, some of the related forces, like the Inquisition, for example, is included in this book and detailed for the first time. This is really the first time a lot of this background is established. Um, it was the first time this was ever done. And so it has this it has this wonderful sort of ragged, ropey naivety about it. That's what I love about these books more than anything. They're experiments. This is long, long, long before Games Workshop have established anything like a house style. There is still that sort of grimdark element to it, but it's shot through with a very 2000 AD sense of humour. What I really like about it is that the artwork, the artwork is really various in terms of its design and its style because they didn't really have in-house artists back then so it's weird it's actually genuinely surreal at times there are pictures in the in these books that are they're not depicting like the wars or the 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 war machines or anything like that they're certainly not trying to sell models or anything like that they are just strange they exist to evoke a particular feeling, and in, in these books it's generally a feeling of disturbance and, uh, and of being unsettled, which is something I really like. The, the book itself is absolutely beautiful. I mean, this is, this is not the one that was re-released recently. Um, 
for they they reprinted um, Slaves to Darkness um, in a very limited fashion for one of the recent events. I can't quite remember which one it was. This is not that edition. This is the, an original copy uh, which I got from eBay, and it's in very very good condition actually because it's such a well produced book. It's hardback, which is beautiful. The cover artwork is insane. You've got a depiction of Corn on here, of Corn himself and all of his legions which is really, really rather lovely. And what you get from the artwork on the front cover is a suggestion of what's in the book, and that is that this is before Chaos Forces in either game system were cohered or codified. They are this polyglot force of just lots of different random elements all thrown together. Um, they are genuinely chaotic, and that's that's really, really fascinating. It makes them very difficult to play, and very difficult to keep tabs on, to how, how people kept a measure of what each individual miniature had, or what they were doing, I just, I do not know in this game system. I mean, even looking through, having read the book from cover to cover, I, I could not tell you how this game system works. It's, it's absolutely lunatic, especially with this book, because in these books... Chaos is genuinely chaotic, and that is not necessarily a good thing, in the sense that it is random. It is largely random. You've got things like die 100 tables of mutations that you can roll for um, your miniatures. You've got random spells that you can roll for your psychers. You've got um, demonic traits. You've got... Um, you've got random traits that you can apply to demon weapons. So you didn't have, like established demon weapons as you do now what you have are demon weapons that you then apply traits to so it's and they they could do so many things they could do so much like from ranging from making your character fly to uh, infecting them with plagues to reflecting magic to um parrying piercing um, immunities to particular effects. It's its absolutely ridiculous. It is absolutely insane. Now, this first book, this... F oh, oh, and another thing. Demon weapons. I mean, I'm, I'm on the page now with demon... We the page is. It's like a whole chapter. Demon weapons were very different back then. They were actually possessed by a demon. Not just like in fluff terms or in background terms. So... What you had to do was establish what type of demon was possessing what type of weapon. And then the weapon could be handled, but it could also escape. The demon could escape at particular points and manifest. So you could have, say, I don't know, a chainsword that was possessed by a greater demon of corn. And that greater demon of corn could erupt spontaneously from the weapon. Uh, it's just absolute nonsense. Absolute lunacy. Um, and all the demons were different. They weren't standardized as they are now. So a greater demon of corn could have all sorts of different attributes. They could have different mutations, different weapons, different armor, different abilities. It's it's so insane. It is so absolutely lunatic. Um, I just it, it's it, it's fun. It's lots of fun because there's so much background, there's so much flavor, there's so much detail. It feels more like a role playing game than a war game or even than a skirmish game. But I just don't know how you played it. I have no idea how you played it. It's a good example of how these things are fun to look back on, but they would not be fun to bring back. At all. Not in this form. Because I, half of the game, I imagine, would be flipping through, looking for whatever attribute table or demonic ability table that you need, or equipment table. Because it's not... Because it is so early, because it is one of the first, it's not necessarily laid out in a very clear fashion. There are tiny little bits and rules scattered all over the place. Um, the pages themselves, they're not laid out as they are now. There is no established format here. So there's stuff everywhere. There's little scraps of artwork. There are these wonderfully characterful, almost like occult borders to the pages. There are pictures of places and of demons and of phenomena that are really weird and distressing. It's really, really cool. I mean, one thing I love is the background. A lot of the background in this is incidental. It's not really salient to the game. It's just these little bits of ambient fluff that really don't do anything other than add flavour to things, and I love that. I absolutely love it. Now, this first book, um, Slaves to Darkness, it deals with Corn and Slanesh 
only. Although the other two are mentioned, Zeech and Nurgle are mentioned in here. So they did have plans to do um, the follow-up book, The Lost and the Damned. But there was this huge production gap between them. There was this huge production gap. So it was ages before The Lost and the Damned actually came out. So the format of The Lost and the Damned, which we'll explore next time, is very different from this book. What I really like is even the background itself has moved on by that point. In the, the 40k section at the back, you get, for the first time, the Horus Heresy. You actually get it detailed for the first time. And it's very interesting because there are certain things that have remained consistent and certain things that have not. For example, in this, at this point, the Space Marines weren't superhuman. They weren't genetically engineered. They were just men in superpowered suits. Um, also, interestingly, the Primarchs didn't exist back then. They, there were these heroic characters, but they were not Primarchs. They were not these genetically engineered... Um, ubermensch superhumans they were just the generals of these forces like for example there are three army lists in the back of the 40k section there's the the world eaters the emperor's children and the black legion um the emperor's children one which i'm on now doesn't even mention anything about a primarch I don't, I don't even know if Fulgrim is mentioned by name in it. I don't think he is. I don't think at this point Fulgrim had been established as the, uh, the commander of the Emperor's Children, or indeed as their Primarch. No, he's not. That's really interesting. That's really fascinating. Horus is mentioned, obviously, but he is not mentioned as a Primarch, because there is no such thing at this point. He is just the commander of the Sons of Horus, which then became the Black Legion. Um, similarly with the World Eaters. I'm not even sure Angron is mentioned here. Um, nope. No, he isn't. So Angron wouldn't come about until later. That's really fascinating. Really fascinating. And of course, the army lists are well weird. They are well weird. They're very difficult to make sense of. Um, but you do get the seeds of what will come later. So, in the Empress Children section, for example, there is a quote from Fabius Bile, Lieutenant Commander of the Empress Children. This is long before Fabius Bile becomes what we know him as today. There's no, no other mention of him. That's the only thing. There is a mention in the Black Legion entry of the first captain of the Black Legion that the Legion swore fealty to after their defeat. But he's not named. He's not, he is not yet Abaddon the Despoiler, but will become that later on. It's fascinating to just go back and look at the roots of these things. The other Chaos Legions are mentioned here too, um, particularly the, the what would become the Undivided Legions. But here, here they are actually classified very loosely as followers of either Slanesh or Korn, and their backgrounds... Well, their background is very, very, very different. Um, the Iron Warriors, for example. The Iron Warriors are listed here very loosely as followers of Slanesh, as are the Alpha Legion, whereas the Word Bearers and the Night Lords are classified as followers of Korn. Interesting, eh? Very, very interesting. One thing I also love about this book is that it's weird. I mean, this is something that characterizes chaos in general, but this is, it's very deeply weird. You've got this whole thing with the, uh, it, at this point, anything related to chaos was just hideously mutated. You couldn't even, many of the miniatures, like for example, the chaos space marine miniatures, you can't even tell they're space marines or that they used to be space marines. They're so hideously mutated. And that carried through into the rules of the game. So any um, any follower of chaos has in, the, in their requisite army list entries certain random numbers of mutations. And you roll for them on, a, on this table that's absolutely enormous. There are so many potentials and they're so strange. Like one of them is crossbred with with a monster or with a, a creature and then within that that option there are other tables die 12 tables of different creatures that you can crossbreed your miniatures with that give them different attributes there are there are ridiculous uh, things like brightly patterned skin bulging eyes blood substitution funny walks <laughs> it's so strange it's so absurd so at this point the legions of chaos were the surreal 
army. They were so surreal. Um, as a result of that, they became very difficult to model. Like, you couldn't tell at the beginning of each battle what each miniature was going to become or what they were going to mutate into, so they were really very heavily symbolic. The miniatures themselves were not what they looked like or what they could do, and that made it even more difficult to keep track of. It made it even more difficult to keep track of. It's absolutely insane. That said, there's a lot of feeling in this book. There's a lot of raw heart. There is this wonderful sort of 1980s power metal thing going on, which I really, really like. It's very, as I said before, it's kind of naive. It's, there is this enthusiasm for the material that just bleeds off the page because it hasn't ever been set down before. And that's very interesting very interesting to me. I also like the fact that, you know, it has on the cover a suggested for mature readers because it doesn't shy away from some of the, um, the more questionable aspects of these, uh, of these creatures, particularly Slanesh. I mean, the, um, the followers of Slanesh have some very interesting attributes indeed, like the, the demonettes are, and the keepers of secrets are universally hermaphroditic, for example. Um, and one of the attributes that you can apply to your followers of Slanesh is, um, is hermaphroditism. Uh, hermaphroditism. Um, that's very difficult to say. Uh, which is really interesting. I really rather like that. Slanesh, there is a particular piece of artwork which I'm looking at right now, which is really near the knuckle. You've got a Keeper of Secrets, and it does seem to be doing something rather interesting with a fiend of Slanesh, whilst, you know, whilst, um, uh, cultists and, and demons of Slanesh look on. It's rather near the knuckle, and I rather like all of that stuff. I really do. That's the kind of thing that appeals to me, to be perfectly honest. There's, uh, some lovely, I mean, everything, almost everything is in black and white, barring the sections with the the pictures of the miniatures and that's really interesting too because you really do get a feeling for how far the miniatures have come the miniatures at this point they have a lot of they have a lot of raw inspiration behind them they they're really fun and weird but they're also because of the limitations in sculpting technology and because there's no there isn't as much in the way of quality control as there is now you know there they are sometimes difficult to discern it's difficult to tell quite what they're depicting to be perfectly honest it's it's fascinating it's a fascinating historical artifact is this book and lots of fun to read especially if you weren't around at this point and you want to know where a lot of details of the background come from, which have carried over to present day manifestations of these chaos forces, and which have been entirely abandoned. It's really fascinating, and although it's, it's rather expensive and difficult to pick up at this point, I would sincerely, sincerely suggest going out and picking this book up. It's really good fun. It's a fun read. There's a lot of material here. It's so thick. It's enormous, this book. And it's just nice to have on the shelf. It's a nice collector's piece. Highly, highly recommended. Um, now, for the next episode, I will take a look at the companion volume, The Lost and the Damned, which is my favourite of the two books. Um, although my, my copy is falling to bits, unfortunately. V loads of fun. That explores Nurgle, Zeech, and their forces so until then i hope you enjoyed this and um, if there's anything else any other subjects you'd like me to cover in this regard please let me know thank you for listening and bye bye